Happy Wednesday. If you are in fact listening to this on Women's Eating Wholeness Wednesday, I am Cherie Burton and I'm your host of this podcast. And it is a podcast for women who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are. And today I thought I would just sort of build on a couple of our last, maybe two or three episodes where we talked about emotional healing, clearing ancestral stories. This may be a new concept that we do actually, in fact, hold a lot of our ancestors' memories in our bodies. We hold not only some, maybe some of their trauma and it can skip a generation or two or five or 10, um, but we also hold a lot of the beliefs they carried, negative and positive. We are here as souls to complete a journey that we contracted to carry forth. And that looks very different for all of us. We're all in this together. I know there's a lot of social unrest right now. To be honest, I haven't even really tapped into the news because it just tanks me. I'm trying to stay in the energy of creation right now. How can I create more compassion? How can I create more tools and resources for people to draw from their own inner resources? How can I create more unity? How can I create more awareness? And I do see the racial injustice and I do see the fires and the tempests and the storms and the anger and I honor all of it. Right? I don't honor racial injustice, but I honor the anger in fact, I do see racial slurs and acts of violence as completely abhorrent and intolerable. And it's time we change it. It's time we change it all. I don't know that any of us have any answers, blanket statement, the peace for the whole world kind of thing. And I wouldn't even attempt to do so. However, right now, all we have are our own hearts, our own minds, our own bodies, and our own temples. So if you are on the earth right now, you have a contract to spread healing in the only way that you know how, through your own life experiences, your own energy and frequency, your own desires, your own gifts and talents. And it's all so individualized. We could talk about like the destiny of our souls and our missions and purpose and path. And I do talk a lot about that on this podcast. However, our highest purpose is to love, is to learn how to be one with all that is, to be one with creation. As I've been sitting with what happened with George Floyd and um, here in Salt Lake City area where I live, there was public safety alert that went out on text message last night uh, about, you know, not being able to go to Salt Lake City limits and get out of your house basically because of all the rioting. Totally honor Black Lives Matter, totally honor All Lives Matter, totally honor all of it because that is each individual and the collective's experience. It is what it is. So because we have been talking about ancestral stories, we have been talking about how we hold trauma in the body and how it can skip generations and how it can show up as actual matter or a frequency and have a charge in the body, whether you're experiencing prejudice trauma, betrayal trauma, sexual abuse trauma. I've seen religious trauma. I've seen family trauma. I mean, it, it's endless. We're all carrying it and it's heating up on this earth right now because literally, I mean, it is literally heating up with fires and all kinds of stuff so that we'll look at it. And we'll examine it and we'll look at how we believe, I should say, how our beliefs are contributing to or helping to heal the injustices. So I just wanted to offer something that I learned with respect. To, and I just want to actually define trauma as something where you're in a position where your safety is threatened and you are helpless in, in a way to make yourself safe. So it's usually something that happens outside of you that has threatened your own safety, whether it's peace of mind or physical safety whatever it might be, your ideologies have been threatened. And so you enter into a state where kind of like, in some degree, your worldview blows up. So I actually experienced trauma. And I talked about this on the last episode when I found out my sister committed suicide. Um, I literally went into shock and um, locked in all of the sore throat and everything I had that day. And every anniversary of my sister's death, it would reveal itself until I realized what was happening. So we can hold emotional charge in our body from a past experience. And it will show up physically unannounced oftentimes until we are ready and safe to address the beliefs and the experiences related to it. So usually the body will wait until you are safe for those either memories to come up or for your body to experience the discomfort. So for instance, if you were in an abusive relationship, we didn't feel safe, then you end that relationship. And you either go into a new relationship where there is safety or you're on your own, your safety isn't threatened. Now your body is like, oh my gosh, like she's, 
she's okay, like, let's deal with what happened now. And so you could experience a variety of different health symptoms, tension, all kinds of things. So our bodies do that for us. They're intelligently designed to bring us to restoration and wholeness. And so if there is a breach in our safety or if there is a breach in our own perception of our wholeness, it will reveal itself at some time where we're ready to take it on, where there's a season where the body perceives, oh my gosh, okay, now she's ready. Let's lay it all out. Trauma happens even by being born. (laughs) You know, we lock in feelings of unsafety all throughout our lifetime at different developmental stages and with different life experiences. And of course, some are more severe than others. So I wanted to just offer something that has uh, helped some of my clients and that has helped uh, me personally as I've been working through some of my own past experiences and some of my ideologies that I've, I'm challenging lately, as well as, um, you know, healing my marriage and all kinds of stuff, dealing with my, the loss of my sister and other things. It revolves around the senses. And in my research, multisensory healing is the bomb because we are multisensory beings and therefore we require a multisensory approach to being well. So our senses, sight, taste, touch, sound, smell, are our feel-good portals. They are pathways to us having a sense of sensory restoration or completing wholeness, feeling whole, feeling good. So what we're looking at, what we're smelling, we're hearing, seeing, looking at, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting, whatever, all of those things contribute to the body's feel good sense of safety, as well as just enjoying life, being in joy, not being in fight, flight, or freeze, which is a trauma response or which is an unsafe response. So our prefrontal cortex takes us out. It's our forebrain. It's not our animal brain. And it takes us out of that state of stress response. It takes us out of fight, flight, or freeze. It takes us out of feelings of unsafety. So when you don't feel safe, you're not reasoning with your prefrontal cortex. You're not reasoning with your higher brain. You're in your animal brain. You're really, there's a part of you that actually feels like you might die. And it's totally subconscious, and um, it's when your heart rate goes up and all your autonomic nervous functions are elevated through those limbic brain structures. So what we want to do is get into the limbic brain, particularly the amygdala, which is where all of that's firing away, and we want to calm it. We want to offer a calming response. And one of the most powerful ways we do that is through our senses. First of all, I say there's kind of this, um, people call it like a trigger bag or an emotional emergency kit, but it's just something that you have on your being, on your person at all times so that when you are faced with a surfacing memory or experience or you are, you know, having just a stress response or you're feeling super triggered or whatever it might be, you're working through your traumas, that you have something with you so that you can actually self-nourish when it happens. Four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste, four things you can see. Now, they don't have to actually be physically on your person, but it is helpful to have a tangible material thing with you that largely holds these things. I mean, if you don't have it with you, and let's say like you're, I don't know, driving, (laughs) and you don't have anything with you, but you can feel your heart rate going up, you can feel your, your breathing, you know, kind of like being more rapid or shallow, and you're shaking or you're, you know, you're experiencing a lot of head tension or muscular tension and you're just like freaking out. Um, fourth, what are four things I can hear right now? Okay, well, I can hear the air conditioning. I can hear the radio. I can hear my kids talking in the background. I can hear my heartbeat <laughs> in my ears. Okay, so four things you can hear. Three things you can touch. I can touch the steering wheel. I can touch my hand over my heart, put my hand over my heart. I can touch the seat next to me, whatever. Then two things you can smell. Now, I'm a huge fan of essential oils. They are a fast access point to the limbic brain, probably the fastest access portal to the limbic brain that we have because you have two olfactory bulbs that sit at the base of your nose, your nasal cavities, and they go right into, they're literally directly connected to your limbic brain. So those olfactory nerves or olfactory bulbs, uh, when you inhale something, those aromatic molecules travel up through the olfactory, to the nasal cavities, through the olfactory bulbs, right into the limbic brain and take you right out of fight, flight, or freeze. It goes straight to your emotional feel-good portals. That's why people snort cocaine and do inhalants. And there's actually a lot of studies happening right now with um, inhalants for depression. That's why aromatherapy can be so powerful 
because it hits that access point very fast. So two things you can smell. Now, they have to be good smells, okay? So, uh, you know, citrus essential oils or flowers, um, something woodsy. Uh, a lot of people like to burn candles or sage or incense or diffuse essential oils, and those are great ways. So two things you can smell. To go back to the car thing, um, you can get really infinitesimal in what you're smelling, just the air, just the air from the air conditioner, rolling the window down and smelling the breeze. Smell your wrist if you put an essential oil or perfume on earlier in the day. So smell is a trickier one just because uh, I feel like that's one you need to have on your person in your toolkit. It's not always accessible to go around smelling everything as easy it is to like see or hear something. Yeah, so four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. So this could look like popping a beadlet in your mouth or a cough drop or a little piece of chocolate or a piece of gum, a mint. Mints actually are super energizing for your, your mouth and your senses because um, those vapors travel up through the roof of your mouth and hit a portal that has direct access to your midbrain. Also, four things you can see. This is fast, especially if you're driving in the car. It's four things. What are four things I can see? When you are being more proactive about this and you actually have created a kit, I would choose four things you can see that really have a lot of grounding and connection and meaning for you that are going to get you right into a healing or calming response. Okay, so that could be a picture of deity. It could be a picture of your family, even a picture of yourself. Believe it or not, your own image, your own voice actually hits your reticular activating system in your brain and is the most convincing image and sound to your subconscious than anything else. So find a picture where you were happy or life was great, maybe a picture of um, something that you want to create, uh, something that holds a lot of meaning to you. And then, yeah, and then just build that kit of four things that you can hear. So maybe um, do you have a little bell you can ring? Um, I like to tell people to put a little candle in their little emotional emergency kit or their trigger bag so that they can light the candle and gaze at the fire. Believe it or not, that's very, very, very calming to the mind brain and brings you into calming response. Fire gazing has been done for centuries. So there's that. But if you really want to continue to keep activating the senses, you know, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste, four things you can see, say out loud, I am safe right now. And there's actually a hold that you can do where you put your right hand under your left armpit. It's kind of like hugging yourself. And then you put your right hand on your left shoulder. Sorry, your left hand on your right shoulder. So your right hand in your left armpit, your left hand over your right shoulder. And that just hugs you. They've done studies on this. I think it's Peter, I forget his last name, but he's a trauma specialist who's written extensively on this and has done clinical work. He's a doctor of psychology, I believe. Oh, Peter Levine, I think is his name. Anyway, so when you do this and you say out loud, I am safe, and you've already activated the other senses, it's almost instantaneous for you to just start to calm because you have to create a hold. You have to create a container so that you feel safe to work through that emotion. Holding therapy um, is a little controversial in the psychological community because it's like requires a therapist to hold you. But if you do that for yourself, you cocoon yourself in and you create that safety that you need so that you can start to breathe, which leads me to my next thing in your little um, emotional emergency kit, which is free, accessible at all times and the most powerful thing that you can possibly do for your emotional body. And that is breathing. So there's this thing where you breathe in for four, you inhale for four seconds deeply through your nose, and then you hold it for four seconds, and then you exhale for four seconds, and then you hold that for four seconds. So inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, and then hold for four, and then inhale again. And you do that four times, so it's like 16. And that's amazing. You could also pair that with an essential oil. You could put an energizing essential oil over your lungs, like a mint oil, like spearmint or peppermint or wintergreen or something that is um, more energizing and opens up the vasodilators in your lungs. You could also put an oil uh, on your lower abdomen. So this is a second chakra area that if you feel threatened by safety, um, it's usually in your lower chakras, like your root chakra, first and second chakra, your sacral chakra and your root chakra. So even just putting one hand below your navel and just holding that while also putting one hand on your heart and breathing can create that safety as well. 
The next thing that you could do is to write. Not everyone loves to write. I've kept journals for years and, you know, I kind of got out of the habit for a while because typing is so much faster and I get writer's cramp and everything. But it's so therapeutic to just get whatever is out. I mean, whatever's, you know, ruminating in you out and into physical, tangible form. You could write, what are my triggers about? You know, as much as you need to. So research shows that when we journal, we're letting out deep emotion, deep emotional debris, things that are a little bit more under the surface that maybe we couldn't recall by talking it out. So you could put all these things together, right? You could put that journal and that pen into, or just a small notebook on the go, into your emotional emergency kit. Um, I like to light a candle when I'm processing emotion and write with the candle and then have an essential oil either diffusing or putting it in the middle of my forehead, which is a, another chakra point. It's your third eye. And it also helps just to calm your thinking just by the touch aspect of it, just by that sense of touch. When you're trying to bust through triggers, <laughs> there's actually an acronym that I think encapsulates it very, very well. And it's SWIRL, S-W-I-R-L. So when you feel yourself swirling, this is what it stands for. S is shattered. W is withdrawing. I is internalizing. R is raging. And L is lifting. So let me explain that a little bit. You cycle through all of these actually in seconds or minutes. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that can take a long time. You typically will cycle. If you got triggered by something, you can flip from feeling devastated to raging within a few seconds. So, but typically what happens is if you're processing through a heavy emotion or maybe you're having a relationship issue or you just got really triggered by something, that S of shattered could also be shame. It could be sadness, shock too. It just means something that's just boom. Like just imagine just a thud in your energy, in your being. And then after that, the initial thing is like to draw back. So think of an animal that gets wounded or any of us really that get uh, a pain infliction of some kind. We're going to withdraw. So that's the W. So we're going to stay away from people. We're going to want to flee. This is where the flight comes in. Literally, we want to just draw back and recoil. I'm like, what just happened? And then the I is internalized. And this is where it can get really damaging because if something happens, and, and even while we're processing the something that happened, we can internalize it and personalize it and make it about us and make a label of ourselves, like, I can't believe I did this, or I am this, or I am that in a negative way. And so this is where perception really becomes key, because it's how you perceive the shattering event, or the shock, or the sadness, or the shame. It's how you perceive that event while you're in the withdrawing phase, before you internalize it and make it about you. Really, we're already whole, remember? <laughs> We're just trying to come back. Like at the core, we're not broken, but we have these events that shatter us. And so we perceive that we're broken and that's where the danger comes in. So in that internalizing, we either swallow the emotion down because it's just too painful to deal with at the moment, or we internalize it and make it about something defective in us. And then the next one is rage, R, rage, some kind of anger, some kind of behavior. Now, this is Interesting, the difference between men and women is that women often internalize the rage inside of them. They internalize that rage, whereas men externalize it. So men will go punch a wall or go, go work in the yard or, you know, go do something physical with sports or something, right? Women often swallow the rage. And women have been silenced for so long, I mean, and collectively that it's just not, we just haven't known the right way to express that. So we swallow it down and, or if you're into your wild, fierce feminine, you will lash out, <laughs> you will be fierce. And we have to be really careful here that we don't wound others when we're swirling. And that last one, the L, you know, after S-W-I-R, the L is lifting. It always lifts. It always ends. It always passes. You can't stay in that kind of a charge for a very long time. Your body will naturally help it. It just, it will lift so that's where the hope comes in. So if you can stay in the pattern when you're in a swirl and you can stay and realize it's just a cycle, it will pass, it will lift. What can I do to create a state change while all this is swirling so that I can break the pattern so that next time that this trigger comes back, I won't experience the same charge. 
I will do what's necessary in the now to release that so that I don't keep, you know, cycling through this swirl where it gets worse and worse and worse and it's never resolving, never breaking up, never lifting. If you were listening to my discussion last week with Candy Graves, we talked about how when you have energy blockages and debris in your body, and we all do, they literally hold matter. They, they, I mean, you can't see it on any of the sophisticated scientific instrument we have now. It's, it's not nearly precise enough. We don't have the technology to see memories and stored emotion in the body. But it will usually show up as tension because that matter from that emotion that's stored builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up to the extent that energetically it creates tension. So we have things like migraines and ulcers, and those are you know some extreme forms of how emotion-based energy can create a physical ailment. But we see this, all of us, all the time. So anyway, because it does hold matter at the energetic level, we have to break that matter up. So doing that work with your senses will help to release the charge of whatever is circulating in your being. 90% of your behavior is driven by your subconscious. So you're not going crazy. It's normal to experience trauma on different levels. It's normal to go into denial. It's normal to sabotage. It's normal to avoid. We all do it. But when you wake up to the fact that you alone are responsible to bring yourself back to remembering your wholeness and to not claiming yourself as broken or a victim, but that you're actually victorious and that the power is in you to find the resources and to do the work in the moment. That is when everything changes. Stuffing it, moving on, it's not going to make it go away, unfortunately. Just what's happening again in, in the U.S. right now with all of the unrest around, you know, the racial discrimination that's been happening for millennia. It begs a deeper discussion on not only what are we carrying as individuals that needs to be broken up, but what are we carrying in the collective consciousness? What are we carrying that is not serving us anymore? How do we break it up? And it won't happen by staying in swirl. It won't happen especially by internalizing it or raging against the system. It happens through the peaceful lifting. Um, and it happens with each of us doing our personal work and asking What can I do? How can I lift the consciousness? How can I serve? How can I spread more awareness? Creating boundaries for ourselves and our communities will create more safety. And being responsible for how we show up and what we say and how we treat people and how we treat ourselves. At all times, we're only ever treating people as a reflection of how we see ourselves and how we feel about ourselves. So my invitation to you this week is to create that trigger bag or that emotional emergency kit. I do have a 22 day depression cleanse where I walk you through how to uh, step-by-step kind of build that little emotional emergency kit. If you want to go to my website, shereeburton.com, it's $22. Um, Again, it's 22 days and I walk through different ways that you can cultivate self-care so that in the moments when things are arising that seem beyond your control, that there are things you can do to ground yourself and to complete the healing process because healing was never meant to be complicated. Thank you for listening and I honor wherever you are on your path to healing because it's perfect and it's all in divine timing and trust the process. This too shall pass. Have a glorious week. Thanks for listening.